Okay, good morning, everybody. We'll get started. Uh, people are still coming on, but I don't want to keep everybody all morning, so we'll get going here. Um, thank you all for participating. We've now, uh, we're at 59 people and still coming in. Uh, so thank you so much for getting involved here. Uh, my name is David Carr. I uh, work at the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. And I manage the Starry Stonework Collaborative, which you probably are aware of. Um, this is our third uh, webinar for the summer. Um, and we're excited to have uh, some really good presentation today. Uh, real quickly, uh, when we get going here, if you'd, everybody make sure you're muted. Uh, many of us are still working at home and uh, we wanna keep the garbage truck noise and the dogs barking and stuff down to minimum. Um, if you have questions, please use the chat box. Uh, as we move up over 60 people here, um, it's the best way to do it without some kind of chaos with everybody trying to talk. And I will do my best to cover as many as we can at the end. Um, and I will read them. So if everybody is not familiar with the chat box or whatever, they can, everybody can hear the question and we'll have uh, our presenters uh, answer them best they can. Um, so with that, uh, we're very excited to have uh, Dan Larkin. He's an assistant professor and extension specialist. And Wesley Glisson, uh, he's a research fellow. Both are from the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center at the University of Minnesota. Um, we're very excited to have him here. Um, Dan is also one of what we call our expert panel for the collaborative and this group of people. Uh, some of them have been studying starry stonework for over a decade and they're there to help us, help me in particular, guide us and advise the program as we move forward. So we're uh, real happy to have Dan helping us with that. Um, so with that, I'm gonna mute myself and uh, we'll let them take it away. All right, uh, thanks David. Um, so again, as uh, I appreciate the introduction, um, I appreciate David and the uh, Starry Stonework Collaborative for having us on here to talk about our work. I'm gonna share my screen here. And hopefully that will come up here. Uh, there we are. Okay, excellent. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. So again, as uh, Dave mentioned, uh, Dan and I are from the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. I'm just gonna make sure that we are all, all good there. Okay, excellent. Thanks for bearing with me, everyone. Um, with the University of Minnesota, um, we're going to be presenting today on our analysis of treatment outcomes in an effort to advance starry stonework management. Uh, and as David talked about, uh, this is work done by Dan and I, but this has also been a huge collaborative effort. Uh, we have many collaborators and data contributors on this project. And if I've left anyone out, I apologize, but there's been uh, a number of folks uh, collecting the data, curating the data, and then passing the data along to us for this project. So, in particular, I want to thank uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, with a couple of folks mentioned specifically there, as well as a number of contractors and other uh, uh, folks who have helped contribute and collect data for this project. So again, this is a hugely collaborative effort. Okay. And with that said, I know many folks in this room um, are familiar with Starry Stoneworks. Just wanted to give a little bit of background to those who this might be the first time they've heard a talk on Starry Stoneworks. Um, scientific name is Nidolopsis obtusa. Uh, Starry Stoneworks is a large growth macroalga. So it's not a, a typical macrophyte. It's not a typical aquatic plant, um, but it's actually an, an algae. Um, it's native to Europe and Asia. It's first recorded in North America in 1974, and it currently is in eight US states that we're aware of. So in regards to impacts of starry stonework, why are we concerned about it? Again, I know many folks are aware of these. I wanted to walk through these though to begin with. So first of all, we know that starry stonework produces substantial biomass and tall, dense beds. So it forms these large pillows that can then blanket out over the lake bottom. It can fill up the water column in a lake. Um, and as this picture shows here, this is just from one rake pole uh, out on Lake Cronus in Minnesota. Um, you can see how much biomass is produced by starry stonework. 
And as you can imagine, that creates problems for recreation. So whether that's getting your boat through a patch of starry stonewort, swimming, uh, fishing, water skiing, uh, any number of uh, water-based recreation. And there's also been some recent work showing that starry stonewort can reduce native macrophyte abundance and richness. Um, this is both from work done by others as well as uh, folks in our lab too, uh, studying lakes in Minnesota. So as you can imagine, there's been uh, lots of starry stonewort management that's taken place since uh, it was first found in, in the States. Um, there's been many attempts to control starry stonewort, particularly in the upper Midwest. And I'm gonna focus on a few states in particular. But the typical strategies include uh, algicide-based treatments, which are typically copper-based. So uh, Qtrain Plus, as is mentioned here, and I'll get and mention a couple others as we go through the talk. Um, and then also physical removal. So this involves hand pulling or mechanical harvest. So there's been anecdotal reports on treatment effectiveness. Uh, these have come from another number of entities um, and just folks, uh, folks experiment, experience on lakes. And we know that we've had some success with small scale control, but really there's been overall mixed results and there's been growth that's come back year after year. So we don't have a great handle on how to treat starry stonewort. So a couple years back, uh, our lab group uh, at MACERC in conjunction with uh, Cronus Lake Association and uh, Blue Water Science, I did a study on Lake Coronis where we actually systematically evaluated and quantified the effects of treatment efforts on uh, Lake Coronis. So this was the first lake that was infested in Minnesota um, and really provided a great opportunity for us to get in early and examine the effects of treatment. And what we found is that algicide treatments as well as combinations of algicide plus mechanical treatments were effective. But uh, this is only one lake from one year. So this study was done in 2016. Uh, we also have limited replication on that lake. So really we need to repeat this kind of work over many lakes and many years. So luckily, there's been efforts across many states um, to treat starry stonewort and also monitor uh, treatment efforts. So in particular, for this talk, I'm going to focus on three states that we included in our study, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Indiana. Here I just have the year of first known infestation, as well as the number of currently infested water bodies. And as most folks are aware, these numbers change uh, year to year. So uh, these were current as of uh, last year. And I also want to mention here that why we chose these three states, both that they are close to Minnesota, but also they represent essentially the Western invasion front of starry stonewort. So they um, provide an opportunity for us to inform stopping the spread further west. Um, and they're also recent invasions. So um, data is new. Perhaps we can really uh, put a cap on infestations and invasions within these states. So as I mentioned, we have monitoring data and treatment data from each one of these states. But these data haven't really been synthesized or brought together before. And that was what this project set out to do, bring together those data uh, and synthesize them, again, to inform uh, starry stonewort management efforts for the future. So in regards to our project goals, we had two main goals. So the first one was just, as I mentioned, to compile that data on starry stonewort treatments, understand what are the most common treatments, what's been going on on these lakes that we've been treating starry stonewort. Second, we wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of these treatments for starry stonework control. So that's, that's where the bulk of my talk is gonna come uh, and what I'm gonna talk about for, for the majority of the talk. And this really comes in two different types of data. So I'll focus on some multi-year data and then within year data. And I'll get into more detail on that as we progress. So I'm gonna focus on this first goal, which is the compilation of starry stonework uh, data on treatments. So as I mentioned, we worked with uh, departments of natural resources from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Indiana, as well as contractors to get any and all available treatment and survey data for all infested lakes in each state. As I mentioned, all those collaborators were uh, essential to making this happen. So in regards to treatment data, that came in a couple different forms. So pesticide application records, primarily from Minnesota, um, Indiana aquatic vegetation management plans, which includes information on uh, treatment records as well as survey data, um, and then also information that was just provided directly from collaborators. So um, just the email or just talking to these collaborators about treatments that were done on lakes. In regards to survey data, we received raw survey data, so just Excel spreadsheets with, uh, with the raw survey data uh, for both 
whole wake point intercept surveys and sub point, inter uh, sub -wake point intercept surveys. And we also received just summary data from some of these PI surveys as well. And I'll get into that in a little more detail as we go on. So I'm gonna start with our treatment data. So this is uh, just a pie chart showing the types of treatment we data re received, excuse me. Um, so we received data on a total of nearly 400 treatments. And as you can see from this graph, the vast majority of these were algicide treatments. Um, we also have a small amount that were physical removal, it's like handful and mechanical harvest, and fewer that were things such as diver assisted suction harvesting, um, so on and so forth. So as we progress through the talk, I just want folks to keep that in mind that the vast majority of these treatments are algicide treatments. And as I mentioned, 90% uh, are algicide treatments. So again, the vast majority. And of those 90%, 88% of these uh, algicide treatments were done with copper-based products. And we did some quick calculations of the total amount of copper that has been used uh, among these lakes uh, for treatments. And that comes out to about 20 tons of elemental copper that has been used again in these three states over the past 10 years. And here's just a breakdown of the type of uh, algicides that have been used for starry stoneworts. Here we have both single uh, algicides as well as combinations that are typically used. I will mention that although this is already a long list, there's an additional 21 combinations that made up less than 1% of our data that I did not include. But as you can see, the vast majority of treatments are done with a combination of Qtrine Ultra and Hydrothal, um, with Qtrine Plus and Clipper uh, kind of rounding out the top three there. And a number of familiar products that, that folks who treat starry stonewarts are up there as well, Comine, Captain, uh, Nautique, um, so on and so forth. And again, I just want folks to keep this in mind. Again, the vast majority of treatments were algicide treatments. And again, the majority of those were uh, Qtrin Ultra and some of these other products here. So in regards to survey data, uh, that came in really three different forms. And I'm gonna talk about each of those briefly here. So the first being whole API surveys. I'm going to use this figure throughout the talk. Uh, if it isn't clear, this is meant to be a, a survey a point intercept grid on a, on a whole lake. So um, we received data from those whole lake PI surveys, point intercept surveys. We also received data on targeted sub PI surveys. So these were done in a smaller area of the lake around where a treatment was conducted. And then we also received data on case studies, which represent higher precision monitoring. So um, this might be using uh, biomass data or an untreated reference area really to get a more precise look at treatment effectiveness. And these represent a gradient of uh, both available data and spatial scale. So as you can imagine, the whole API surveys are the largest spatial scale and also have the most available data. We had fewer data from targeted sub-PI data, uh, sub-PI surveys, and then even less data from these case studies with this higher precision monitoring. So back to our project goals. I've focused already on the compilation of the uh, starry stonework treatments and survey data. And now I'm gonna move into the evaluation of the treatment effectiveness. So before I begin, I realize it's a little unorthodox, but I wanted to mention our overall key findings. And that way I can kind of uh, bring those into the fore uh, right here. And then I can kind of dive into them individually as I go forward. So I'm gonna break these down by each of the data types that I mentioned earlier. So first, in regards to the HOIC PI surveys, or when we're looking at a HOIC response to treatment, here's what we found. First, we found that the extent of starry stonewort within infested lakes is significantly increasing over time since the year of infestation. Next, we found that current treatment practices don't appear to be effective at reducing that extent of starry stonewort or abundance within infested lakes. Again, this is at the whole lake level. When we honed in on those sub-PI surveys, so looking at the response of starry stonewort to treatment within those treated areas, we saw similar results. So frequency of occurrence and abundance remain largely the same following treatment. Lastly, when we looked at those case studies so that higher precision, higher resolution, uh, data, we found that treatments actually can be effective at reducing biomass through nuisance control, but that timing is important. And again, I'm going to go into detail on each one of these results throughout the talk. Next, we found that physical removal can, be, can also be effective at reducing biomass, so things like hand pulling um, for small infestations. 
And lastly, uh, we uh, recommend that untreated uh, reference areas and untreated reference lakes are really needed to understand treatment effectiveness. Um, again, I'll get into more detail as we go on. So we're gonna, gonna walk through each one of these individually and I'm gonna start with these whole lake PI surveys and what we found from those. So again, the data that I'm gonna show next is gonna all represent the whole lake response to treatment from these whole lake PI surveys. So what did that data look like? We had data from 35 lakes. This is the breakdown by state. So the most in Indiana, followed by Wisconsin and then Minnesota. This data spanned 10 years from 2010 to 2019 and represented 109 lake years. So that's an individual lake in a given year. And this gives us a, a total of 151 PI surveys. So the data came in two different forms, which many folks who do PI surveys or are familiar with these kind of surveys would be familiar with. So the first being frequency of occurrence. So this is just whether or not starry snow occurred at a given point on your PI survey grid. And this would just be starry snow is given a one or a zero for whether or not it occurred at a given point. And then for a whole lake, this would be a value between zero and one as a proportion or between zero and 100 as a percent. So these, on these surveys, there's also rate density that's collected. So this is a measure of abundance. Uh, typically, this is done as a number between one and three. So one means that it's on the rake, low abundance, three meaning that it has higher abundance. And we standardize all, standardize all the surveys we received to be on the scale between one and three. So I'm gonna start with the multi-year data. So this first plot I'm gonna show, I just wanna orient you to it. Uh, the response is gonna be frequency of occurrence. So just as I mentioned earlier, that's just gonna be on a scale from one to zero. And then we're gonna be looking at years since infested. So this graph is going to show uh, for all the lakes that we have data for, um, what's been happening in those lakes since the year of first infestation. Before I put the data on here, I just wanna let folks know, each color is gonna represent a different lake and each line will represent a different lake for which we have more than one year of data. And here's what those data look like. So as you can see, the majority of lakes have been increasing in starry snow frequency of occurrence since the year that it was first, that lake was first infested. And again, this is a measure of the extent of the starry storm population within a lake. And one thing that you might notice right away is that there is at least one line that seems to be following an opposite trend. And I wanna focus in on that one. So that is Pike Lake from Wisconsin. This is our only lake that has never received treatment and for which we have greater than two years of survey data. There's also one other lake that has not received treatment and has more than one year of survey data, and that's Lake Winnebogoshish in Minnesota. So as I mentioned, the majority of these lakes, aside from Pike Lake and Winnebogoshish, have received some form of treatment since, there's, since the first infestation. So with that, I'm gonna go into our within-year data. So from here on out, we're gonna be looking at the effects of treatment within a given year. And that's what I'm gonna focus on for the remainder of the talk. So just to orient folks to what this, our data looks like and what we're dealing with, um, I have this little figure that I'm gonna, I'm gonna show and kind of bring in each piece of data uh, one at a time. So uh, represented here on the, on the horizontal axis is lake year. So this is surveys from a given lake within a given year. These are all made up, they're just hypothetical, but I uh, just wanted to demonstrate what our data looks like. And first of all, we might have a scenario where we, there was a PI survey done, a treatment was done, and then another PI survey was done. So this is really the ideal situation. Um, this would be the best case scenario. But we also have data in a couple other forms. So there might have been a treatment done and then a survey conducted after that treatment. There might be a survey conducted in a lake here where there was no treatment. And lastly, there might be a survey conducted, a treatment, and then no follow-up survey. So like I said, ideally we'd use the data from this first scenario and that represented about 58 surveys, um, 29 lake years, but we have all this other data and we wanted to utilize that to start with. And as I mentioned, this represents 100, nearly a little over 150 surveys and 109 lake years. So that's where we started with our analysis. And in doing so, we treated all lakes that were either surveyed before treatment or in a year where there was no treatment as not treated. And as you would then maybe assume we consider all these lakes that were uh, surveyed after treatment as treated. 
So for our analysis of this data, we used a generalized linear mixed effects model or a GLMM. Our response to start out with was just starting some somewhere frequency of occurrence, again, extent within the lake. And we used three predictive variables. So the first being years since infested. As my graph showed earlier, we know that that's an important predictor of frequency in a given year. So that's why we included that one. Uh, we also included the proportion of the lake that was treated with algicide. So we initially thought that this made sense as treat more, you should be able to knock back frequency of occurrence even more. And we also included a variable for just whether or not the lake was treated. So this is a discrete variable, yes or no. We also included a random effect or grouping variable by lake. So we're keeping all those results for each lake uh, similar. So I'm gonna bring in the results for each one of those predictive variables one by one. And the first one, it's probably not surprising because it's very similar to what we've seen before. And this is that frequency of occurrence is increasing in, uh, in terms of years since infested. So this is very similar to that plot that I showed, except that instead of many lines for many lakes, they're all uh, just uh, form one line for an overall effect. For this next plot, this is frequency of occurrence versus the proportion of the lake that's treated with algicide. And this is a little unintuitive at first, but when we thought about this result, uh, we thought that maybe what was happening is that larger infestations have a greater proportion of the lake that gets treated. Um, so it might not necessarily be that there's more starry stoneworts when you treat more, but just that there's more starry stonework to begin with in these lakes. So moving on to our next predictor, again, this is, we're looking at frequency of occurrence, and this is just our yes or no variable. So whether the lake was treated or not treated. And here's what we found. Star stonework was actually at a greater frequency of occurrence or extent in the lake after treatment compared to lakes that were not treated. And this result was significant. And just to folks who may not be familiar with these box and whisker plots, the uh, gray square represents essentially the bulk of the data with that dark black line representing the median of the data. The whiskers extend to nearly the entire data sets um, with any outliers being expressed as points. And we don't have any outliers here. So again, this just box represents the bulk of the data. So this suggests a pattern, but, but can we get a clear picture? And I wanna go back to this figure that I showed before. So we have these different types of survey data and we have this really nice situation for these data where we have paired pre and post surveys done uh, before and after treatment. So this is a smaller subset of the data. But this might help us get a clear picture of really what's going on. So we subset our data and just used these types of data here. Again, we considered surveys conducted before and surveys conducted after treatment. This represented 58 paired surveys. So still a large enough data set to be able to get some information. And now we have a data set that looks like this, all paired pre and post survey data. So in regards to analysis, we're in a very similar model to what we'd done before when we used all the data. We ran a GLM. And this time for our response, we're gonna be looking at both frequency of occurrence and rate density. This time we just use one predictor. So this is either before or after treatment. And again, we had a random effect or a grouping variable for lake years. So we wanna keep each one of those lake years uh, consistent. And here's what we found. So I'm gonna start with the frequency of occurrence data. And I had this little figure to help us out. Again, all the stars are the same because each one is just given a one or a zero. So uh, in regards to before and after treatments, here's what we found. That similar to results when we used all the data, that star somewhere appears to have greater frequency of occurrence after treatment. And this result was significant. So when we move to rate density or measure of abundance, now our scale is a little bit different here. We're looking between one and three, three being greater abundance, one being less abundance. And again, we're looking at both before and after treatment. And we found a similar result. Um, the result was significant that after treatment rate density seems to be greater uh, after treatment. So we focused so far on a whole lake response to treatment, but we wanted to dive in deeper and look at just the responses within those treated areas to get a, a clearer picture. So for uh, starting here, I'm gonna be talking about just targeted sub-PI surveys or responses within treated areas. So what does that data look like? So it's a little less data. We have data from 15 lakes, 
or 122 surveys. Again, we have the same kind of data that's collected for this whole API surveys, frequency of occurrence and rate density. And I just wanna uh, use this figure here to show what the data looks like and how we uh, made some simplifications to the data set to be able to analyze it effectively. So over time within a lake where that has been treated or in one of these treatment areas, you may have an initial survey done early in the season, another survey treatment, a follow-up survey after that treatment, maybe another survey is done, and finally a survey at the end of the year. Now you can imagine this might make things complicated to try to understand what's the effect of any given treatment uh, in a treated area. So to simplify and to be able to analyze these data, we just use those surveys that were conducted before and after that initial treatment each year. And just to give you a little bit more data on what those selected uh, treatments looked like, they were all algicide treatments, all of them copper-based, and this smaller data set now has seven lakes and 28 paired surveys. So here's what we found for, uh, for those sub-PI data. And again, we're going to be focusing first on frequency of occurrence, and all these um, plots or these two plots that I'm going to show next, again, we ran a similar GLMM to the ones that we've ran before. And as our predictor, we just used before and after treatments. And here's what we found. So as you can see, while there was a small decrease in frequency of occurrence, this was not significant. Essentially what this is telling us is that uh, frequency of occurrence is not changing uh, after treatments are done. Next, when we looked at rake density, again, our measure of abundance, we see a similar pattern. Again, a small decrease, but you can see our scale here only goes from 1 to 1.5. So this is a non-significant decrease, um, essentially telling us that rake density is the same both before and after treatment. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, okay, so are these treatments really ineffective? And I want to talk on this slide just briefly about what we can determine and what we still can't clearly know from the analysis that we've done. So what we do know is that we are not reducing stary somewhere below pretreatment levels. That's clear from the analysis that we've done. But a question that still remains is would there be even more stary somewhere in a lake if we didn't treat at all? So we might expect that throughout the year, there's going to be more growth. Stary somewhere is going to grow up more throughout the season that higher frequency of occurrence and greater abundance. This just seems like the natural phenology of any macrophyte, uh, and particularly starry snowwort. But what we don't know is if that treatment is keeping these levels low compared to what would naturally be occurring, or if they'd just be staying the same. So what we really need are untreated control lakes or control areas within a lakes, lakes to get a clear picture. So we need more scenarios like this one above or we've not treated and let starry snowmore grown up to see how we can compare to areas that were treated. And the situations that I'm gonna talk about next in our case studies are gonna to try to get at that. So as I mentioned, um, uh, next I'm gonna talk about some of these case studies where they dive in a little bit more higher precision monitoring um, and analysis. So in regards to these case studies, uh, the ones that I'm going to talk about first have a, both a treated area and an untreated reference area that has been compared to each other over time. And this is what we call a before, after, or control impact design. I'm going to walk through what that looks like. But really, this can help us understand what's going on over time naturally in a lake compared to what's going on in our treated areas. So here's just a quick figure to show you what that looks like. So here we have two areas on a lake. We have the area that's with the black box, which is a treated area, and then the untreated area in the gray box. And so in these situations, we conduct a survey before any treatment was done in both of these areas. And ideally, these would have similar levels of starry stonewort, uh, frequency of occurrence, and rake abundance, and similar environmental conditions. So next, we do a treatment in the treated area, and then we conduct a survey after the treatment. And again, this picture represents the ideal situation where you have less starry snowwort in the treated area and about the same or maybe more starry snowwort in the reference location. So the first case study that I want to talk about is from Lake Cronus in Minnesota. 
Floyd Cronus, located near Painesville, Minnesota. I have a map up here in the corner of the screen, which hopefully my, my face isn't blocking, but just to give you an idea of where that lake is. Um, it's the first lake that was known to have starry snowmore in Minnesota. Um, it's a fairly large lake, around 3,000 acres. And the initial infestations, infestation was rather large, around 250 acres were known to be infested in 2015. Uh, since that time, there's been algicide treatments conducted, as well as combinations of mechanical harvest and algicide treatments. And this is the same figure that I showed earlier on in the talk, um, representing our study that we conducted with Cronus Lake Association and Blue Water Science, a contractor there doing surveys on the work, uh, on the lake, excuse me, um, on Lake Cronus. And what makes this situation ideal is that we have an untreated reference area down here, if you can see my cursor. Um, and then we also have some treated areas. So we can compare the two over Thanks. time. Silences. Um, and so biomass is actually measured in these plots um, by the Cronus Lake Association in conjunction with Blue Water Science. I also want to mention that the Minnesota DNR um, also collected biomass data um, in subsequent years. And again, with these data, we can compare the growth in untreated areas compared to what's happening in these treated areas and uh, also examine timing of treatment. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, what has happened over time in these treatments. And this is data from 2016. So uh, as a response, we have biomass. And what I'm gonna show is uh, data from two different areas. So areas that were treated with algicide and an untreated reference area. And on our bottom axis, we just have time. So what we can see here is that uh, initial algicide treatment, or rather a late season algicide treatment, substantially reduced biomass in the area that was treated with algicide compared to the untreated reference area. And you can see how this might be important because we see that the untreated reference area actually declined in biomass, but much less than was declined with the algicide treatment. Now there was a subsequent algicide treatment conducted in this area later in the season. What we can see is that that treatment uh, did not further reduce biomass in the treated area. And this is simply because there was so much bio, so little biomass left um, after the initial treatment. So I'm going to move to the following year on Lake Coronis. Again, our response is biomass. And we have these two areas, an area treated with algicide and an untreated reference area. So this situation is going to be a little bit different. So we have an early season treatment. And as you can see here, that that treatment wasn't super effective at reducing starry somewhat biomass or keeping that biomass low compared to the untreated reference area. Again, this is a pretty early season treatment. So uh, here they let the starry somewhat grow up for another month or so. Um, as you can see, we have similar biomass levels, both in the algicide treatment area and the untreated reference area. But then there's a subsequent algicide treatment. And as you can see pretty clearly, that substantially reduced the biomass in the algicide treated area compared to the control. And we can see that this uh, trend kept biomass levels fairly low for the treated area compared to the untreated control. And I just want to stress that this is information that can only be gathered when we have this untreated reference area to compare. I'm going to mention uh, another case study here, uh, just so I'm not too biased towards Minnesota. So this is Big Muskego Lake in Wisconsin, um, a little bit smaller lake, but still a fairly large lake, but a fairly shallow lake, uh, only a mean depth of four feet. A starry stone was also discovered here in 2015 with infestations near the public accesses. Uh, there was algicide treatments that were conducted 2015 to 2017 on this lake. And I'm going to be focusing in on just the 2015 data. And here's what that looks like. Again, we have a similar plot to what I showed before for Lake Coronas. We have biomass as our response. We have an algicide treated area and an untreated reference area. And similar to Lake Coronas, we see that this algicide treatment was effective at reducing biomass in the algicide treated area compared to the reference that was untreated. So, so far I've been focusing on just these algicide treatments. But you may be asking or wondering, what about the other types of treatments that were done? So this is the same plot that I showed before, just a pie chart showing that, again, the vast majority were algicide treatments. But there were some treatments that were hand pull and mechanical harvest. And I want to focus on a couple case studies from those situations as well. So first, I want to talk about Grand Lake in Minnesota. 
So Starry Summit was first discovered here in August of 2017 uh, during Starry Trek, which is a statewide volunteer search for Starry Summit infestations. So subsequent surveys determined that Starry Summit was limited to near the public access and snorkel searches determined that there is uh, one large patch and then several smaller patches around that access. So they were able to do really targeted treatments. And what they did is that they actually did just handful uh, treatments starting in 2017 through 2019, and I believe through 2020 as well here. Um, again, there was no algicide treatments done here. It was solely handful. So I'm gonna walk through the results uh, from what they found here in Grand Lake. So this uh, graph is gonna be a little bit different than the ones I showed from Lake Coronis and Big Muskego, and that here we're looking at biomass removed. So this is the amount of biomass that was actually physically pulled from the lake. And so I'm gonna start with 2017. What we can see is that the initial biomass removal was fairly large. This would have been in July of 2017. Then a subsequent biomass removal uh, was very small compared to the initial, showing that there was a substantial reduction in the biomass uh, in that infestation. So if we move to 2018, what we see is that subsequently that first removal in 2018 was fairly small compared to the initial biomass removal in 2017. And then subsequent removals had less and less biomass. When we go forward to 2019, we again see that this appears to be a fairly effective method of controlling starry stonewort. The initial biomass removal in 2019 was very small compared to the initial in 2017 and 2018, and subsequent biomass removals were, were very small. So again, this is just showing that for these small infestations um, that can be isolated, hand pulling can be an effective strategy. I'm gonna travel back to Lake Coronis here for one last example. Um, so one thing I have not talked about is this mechanical harvesting treatments and combinations of mechanical harvest plus algicide. And I wanna focus in on those now. So we're going back to 2017. And now I'm gonna show results from an untreated reference area in an area that was mechanically harvested. And I'm gonna walk through this as we go. Again, we're looking at biomass and we just have time on the bottom axis here. So first, um, we see that mechanical harvesting initially, which was done in July, appeared effective at keeping biomass levels low compared to untreated reference areas. Um, although the tractor was not done in the lake, they had a mechanical harvester that actually was able to pull up starry somewhere from the bottom of the lake. But as we move forward in time in, this, uh, in 2017, we do see that biomass was able to increase again after the harvesting was stopped. And this is at similar levels to what we see in the untreated reference areas. So while it might provide uh, short-term effects, uh, those ap don't appear to be lasting. But I want to compare that to an area that was mechanically harvested with a follow-up outside treatment to an untreated reference. So now we're looking at 2016 data. And here what we see is that an initial mechanical harvest kept biomass fairly low in this a treatment area. But then as we move forward, a subsequent algicide treatment reduced that biomass even further, again, when, when you compare it to the untreated reference. There was a subsequent algicide treatment on this lake. Again, this is similar to the results that I showed before, which didn't see, appear to have much of an effect. And this is largely due to the fact that biomass has already dropped uh, so low. So again, this is just to reiterate the fact that while mechanical harvesting alone might not be effective for the whole season, that when combined with algicide treatments, it may be an effective strategy. So all right, we've come full circle here. I wanna round back to our overall findings. And now that we've had a chance to dive into everything and see the figures, I just wanna go over those one last time here. So in regards to our whole lake response from those whole lake PI surveys, again, saw that population extent is significantly increasing over time in infested lakes and that current treatment of practices don't appear to be effective at reducing that starry similar frequency of occurrence or abundance. In regard to the response within treated areas, which we got from these sub-PI surveys, we found that frequency of occurrence and abundance remain largely the same following treatments. Lastly, with these case studies that we just looked at, we we're able to tell that treatments can be effective at reducing biomass for nuisance control. Again, timing seems to be important. Some of those really early season or really late season treatments may not be effective. Also from the example in Grand Lake, 
we can see that physical removal for small infestations can be really effective at reducing biomass. Um, and as I also showed, mechanical harvesting in combination with outside treatments can also be effective. And again, I want to reiterate this point that I made that really more untreated reference areas and untreated reference lakes are needed to understand treatment effectiveness. And I want to go into this in just a little bit more detail. Um, again, this is what really helps us understand if we're keeping starry stonewort uh, levels low in a lake compared to what they'd naturally be doing. So if possible for monitoring efforts, uh, we should include an untreated reference area on the lake and keep this area the same over time, so year after year after year. Also, we might want to consider not treating but monitoring some infested lakes. So this would be like Pike Lake in Wisconsin. Um, and these untreated reference lakes, uh, untreated lakes can act as references that can be monitored over time so that we could see if we are, don't treat in a lake, what is happening with sorry stoneworts. Again, we only have one or two lakes that we can have this data for, so we really need more lakes uh, to, for these data. Lastly, one point I want to mention is that if possible, if feasible, uh, biomass should be measured. So this would be, uh, again, within just a small treated area. This is probably not something that's going to be feasible over a whole lake. And this is because that this might be a more accurate measure than rate density. And just briefly, I want to just show these two pictures here. These would both be probably a maximum rate density of three or five, depending on your system, but represent different biomass. Here, so you can see uh, this picture here. Uh, this gentleman has a lot more biomass um, than uh, this right here, but these would both be, both be rated similarly. So in regards to management recommendations, first and foremost, as with most aquatic invasive species, we want to prevent spread. That's because of this situation. We know that when starry stormwater gets into a lake, it's very hard to keep that population extent low. And as that population extent increases, it becomes more likely that it's transmitted to other lakes. Next, if found early and it's isolated, hand pulling seems to be a very promising strategy. And for targeted areas, nuisance control can be achieved with algicide treatment and those combinations of algicide and mechanical treatment. Again, this is not going to remove starry stonework from the lake, and it's not going to necessarily decrease the extent of the infestation in the lake, but it can keep biomass down. And again, as I mentioned, those combination treatments appear to be effective for this as well. But we know that for these large established populations, we need to have realistic expectations. So reducing the within lake extent is highly unlikely. And again, this is that plot that I showed earlier, showing that since time of infestation, frequency of occurrence is increasing in starry stormwater infested lakes. And this is different compared to other invasive species where we've been managing over time, such as curly leaf pondweed, where we see that since time of infestation, when we've actually been treating repeatedly in these lakes, we do see frequency of occurrence uh, reducing year after year. Uh, and this is recently published results uh, from uh, uh, other folks in our lab group here. So um, I just want to stress that this is kind of two different scenarios. We don't seem to be able to reduce that extent of starry stomach in the lake uh, as we can with other invasive species. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. I believe uh, folks can put those in the chats um, and we'll be happy to answer those. Thank you, Wes. That was fantastic. A lot of good information there, although not all, you know, the exciting information we all hope for, the magic bullet, but that's all good. So yeah, a lot of questions coming in. I'll start reading them right away here. Um, what are potential risks or side effects of copper-based algicides? Uh, to other lake organisms or even drinking water? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I will admit right now that I am not an expert on, on that issue in particular. Um, we do know that uh, copper can have effect on other native macrophytes, so particularly our native caras, which are similar to starry stoneworts. Um, in regards to drinking water and things of that nature, again, I, that's not something that I would be comfortable uh, speaking on, I know that the levels that are introduced into lakes are typically pretty safe um, in the short term, so uh, folks can, uh, you know, swim in these waters and, and things of that nature. Um, unfortunately, what, what happens though is over time, those copper, uh, the elemental copper can uh, go to the lake bottom and then it stays there essentially. And so we don't have a lot of great information on the long-term effects uh, of those copper treatments, you know, over 5, 10, 20 years. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
And I just want to add to that. I think that's a it's an important question. And there are copper is used as a aquatic pesticide in, for a number of things. And I'm not sure about the situation in other states, but I know in Minnesota um, there are a lot of copper treatments for swimmers itch or for nuisance algae growth. And so I think that's an important question to address to get a better handle on the environmental fate and potential consequences. And I know Wes and I, uh, is, we have a colleague, a graduate student who is working on that question. She's looking at um, use of copper for zebra mussel control and is, um, you know, sort of examining what's known about the ecotox effects more generally. Great. Okay, we've got uh, at least three questions on hand pulling. Uh, the first two are kind of related. One is, uh, can you just describe the hand pulling methodology? And the second one is, uh, timing is important. What is the best time for hand pulling? Yeah, th those are great questions. And I'm gonna, I'll take the first stab at this and, and Dan can jump in if you'd like. So um, on Grand Lake, um, from what I'm aware of, that those were done using scuba. So they were able to dive down and be very precise about where they were uh, grabbing the fairy stoneworts. I've also heard of other efforts just done walking through the water, but that makes it more difficult because that can caught up the water. Um, so ideally this would be done on scuba or snorkel um, where depths are shallow. Um, in terms of timing, that's a little bit more difficult to, to say. We don't have great data on that, um, but because these are for infestations that are relatively small, um, I would say, you know, midway through the season, but it may not matter as much for these small infestations versus a very large infestation where targeted herbicide treatments um, might be, the timing might be much more important. You might want to wait till that biomass is at its peak. So I would suggest that if you're hand pulling, it's a small infestation, you might want to get out a couple times throughout the season um, early on and then throughout to make sure that the growth is not coming back. Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would think of it like the way you would weed your garden, um, that it's something you want to do on a recurring basis and stay on top of. And so I think having multiple hand pulls um, through the season is good. And it can be logistically challenging because of loss of visibility as you start to pull stuff up and you get, you know, flocculent sediments um, making visibility difficult. So I think kind of, you know, sustaining that effort um, both over time within a summer and then from year to year, it's really important. Um, follow on question about hand pulling or harvesting, uh, does the is there evidence that starry stormers spread more? Uh, do inf infestations increase in size due to uh, hand harvesting, hand pulling or harvesting? Yes, yeah, so as far as I know, we don't have great data on whether that increases the spread or not. Um, I think that's a tough thing to necessarily get a handle on. I would, um, I would be cautious about the mechanical harvesting for that respect. We know that starry stoneworts uh, from its nodes, from its baubles can re-sprout. So you may be churning up starry stoneworts and cutting it up into smaller pieces that can spread throughout the lake. Um, so I know there's been some efforts with uh, barriers and things of that nature, and that might be a, a good way to go. Um, and again, I'm not super familiar with, uh, you know, the actual mechanics of some of these harvesters to be able to say that, but I think that's certainly a concern. I think it's less so with hand pulling because as you're pulling it, you can actually see where you know a piece might be drifting off. Um, so I'd be less concerned with hand pulling than I would be for mechanical harvesting in that regard. And then um, continuing with the mechanical harvesting, uh, if you mechanically harvest a uh, cleared a boating channel, can that reduce the amount of spread due to the boat activity? And that's a great question. Um, and I know that on Lake Cronus, that was um, essentially what they were doing with, uh, I didn't mention that it was exactly a channel, but they have a, ch a channel that they were harvesting again, that they were uh, funneling boats through. So um, we don't have great data on that per se, but um, I think that in terms of nuisance reduction, that, that could be effective, um, certainly for just being able to navigate your boat through an area like that. Um, and as long as your motor isn't churning through the bed of starry stonewort, then yeah, I would say that's probably uh, could be helpful for reducing the spread throughout the lake and to other lakes if that's an area where you're bringing boats on and off the lake. Yeah, and I would, I would say to add to that, you know, there's a lot of, starry stonewort is not the same um, in all lakes. There's a lot of variation lake to lake in extent and growth and biomass produced. So I think that's a good thing for people to sort of be attentive to 
four lakes with starry stonewort and if you see it getting you know up into the water column in an area where there's a lot of boat or traffic to think about ways to mitigate that risk. Okay, uh, here's a long one from somebody in your area, I believe. How are you defining effectiveness of treatments? Our lake-wide evaluation of Lake Coronas indicated that CARA has declined since 2015. Does your analysis include evaluation of impacts to native macrophytes and or organisms? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. And in discussions with our collaborators, um, we've we've been talking about these things as well. So the short answer is no, we have not incorporated that into our analysis to date, the effects on native species. Um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of data to, to deal with and handle. So that might be something that we look at down the road, but um, initially it's not something that we uh, have looked at yet. But I think that's an important thing to note is that, yeah, we, we haven't looked at that component yet. So there could be you know, as we mentioned, there could be effects or there have been effects on native species such as Kara. Um, and I think that's going to be an important research topic moving forward. Um, you know, what's happening in these lakes as we treat over time to the native species. Um, but yeah, the short answer is we, we haven't uh, included that in our effects of treatment. No. Yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, it is an important question. And so for now, our measure of effectiveness is change in starry stonework. Um, the effects on native species become, it's, it's challenging um, because there are potentially, you know, a couple different ways that native species can be effective, uh, affected. So there's the risk of non-target impacts, as was mentioned to Kara, um, or other carophytes in particular, and then there's also the potential consequences of increased extent of starry stone work. So we can imagine you know, treatment having negative effects on uh, native species. We can imagine it having positive effects through, um, if you're able to reduce starry stonework biomass that might displace native species, we can imagine both of those occurring simultaneously. Um, so it, it's an important question and it's one that's a bit more challenging to look at than just what's happening to the starry stonework itself. Uh, question about what is DASH treatment, D-A-S-H? Yep, great question. And I, I may have mentioned that, I may not have. Um, that is diver assisted suction harvesting. Um, so essentially, again, I'm not an expert in this. I've never done this myself. Um, and Dan might be able to chime in on this too. But essentially a like a large vacuum-like tube is used to suck aquatic plants, and in this case, sorry, somewhere from the lake bottom. Um, and again, this has been implemented in a, a couple situations in Minnesota. Um, I didn't present on those. We don't have great data on the effectiveness of those treatments, and it just kind of outside the scope of uh, the things I wanted to focus on today. Um, but that's that's essentially what that that is. And um, yeah, I, Dan might have a little bit more to say, but um, that's that's it. Yeah, and I'm blanking on the name. Some, maybe somebody can put it in the chat. There's somebody who used to be a county AIS person in Wisconsin, Bradley, forgetting last name, um, who did some pretty extensive dash and DASH evaluation efforts. One thing, you know, I think that can appeal to people about DASH is this idea that you have the starry stuff, you have the bubbles and the sediment, and you can sort of vacuum things up and get rid of it. But that is unlikely, depending on the state and regulations. I know in Minnesota, you know, modifying a lake bottom is, um, is a big deal and not something that would be generally approved. And so, I think people picture DASH as you're going to vacuum up all the traces of starry stonework. The reality is you're supposed to use it essentially in conjunction with hand pulling and kind of stick it in like a vacuum tube to get it out as you do the, um, the diving and hand pulling. Okay, we have um, a few more minutes. I'll go through some more. You've got several thank yous and great jobs from other researchers and colleagues here. Andrea Kirkwood, Ken Carroll, Brian Ginn from Canada. Nice job, Wesley. Um, what, okay, help me out here. I may mispronounce this one. What do we know regarding slow rate of increase in Lake Winnebagoshish and decrease in the, in the untreated lake in Wisconsin? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. And I personally don't have a lot of firsthand experience with those uh, lakes in particular. I know um, some of our colleagues certainly do. Um, Lake Winnebagosh is a little bit of an interesting lake, but I know from Pike Lake, it's a relatively natural lake, um, from what I understand. Um, 
I, I don't believe there's a lot of Lakeshore property owners and things of that nature. So um, I know that's one thing that might make it a little bit different. I know when there's a lot of Lakeshore property owners, there's a little bit more urgency and desire to get rid of Starry Stormwater on the lake. So it might be less desirable to leave a lake untreated. But um, yeah, that's, I don't have a lot of knowledge on those lakes in particular um, and um, you know why they may or may not have been treated or what might make them different from other lakes. But I think one key thing is just to note that it's important to have these lakes kind of no matter what they are um, in regards to their environmental qualities, just to have them as references to our treated lakes. Um, yeah, and with that, maybe I can let Dan, Dan jump in if he has anything to add. Yeah, yeah, so Pike, like, we haven't done any field work there, but I've heard um, from others that it's, yeah, it's a very high quality lake. Um, it's in a pretty populated part of Wisconsin, but it's in, you know, good ecological condition. It has high native plant diversity and good water quality. So it may be that it's not, um, you know, a more disturbed or eutrophic lake where there's potentially a lot of potential for sorry stone wort to become really abundant. So it may be that the, the good ecological condition, good cover and diversity of native species is sort of keeping it in check. And then in, with Winnebogoshish, um, it's quite different. Um, the starry stone wort there is different than we see in certainly Coronas and a number of other lakes where um, there's quite a bit of extent of it, but it's it's sort of shorter statured. Um, it's it's not kind of the profuse growth um, that we see on some other lakes. And so I think that right there, the fact that we have, you know, really just these two untreated reference lakes and the fact that they have these unique characteristics as all lakes do, I think just really reinforces the point that we need more monitoring of untreated reference conditions because we're really kind of operating in the dark in the extent to which we can evaluate treatment effectiveness by not having a good set of baseline data to compare to. And we got a bunch more questions. It's already 11. If you guys have a little bit of time, we'll try and get through them. Um, uh, this is... And then back to hand pulling, how small is small? I believe it means area, and then a f on disposal, which is a good question. Once out of the water, what happens to the bull bills? Do they stay dormant or do they die off and become non-threatening, so to speak? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I, I wish I had a better definition of what how small is small. I know that um, I didn't mention the exact uh, sizes of some of the patches, but, you know, certainly, um, yeah, a couple I'd say less than a couple of square meters or something on that nature. So something that you could visually see when you're in the water and being able to, to, to pick, uh, um, pick up or, or pick apart. So uh, I, I don't have an exact answer on that, but um, something that certainly less than an acre in extent and probably much less than that, um, uh, something that can be, be handled pretty easily. In terms of disposal, um, there's, I know that each state and kind of county has their own guidelines on how best to do that. Um, in regards to the bubbles remaining dormant, um, we conducted a study in our lab that found that the, both the bubbles and the biomass can actually dry out very, fairly quickly. So if there's a safe area away from the water to let that material dry out over time, um, that can be an option. Um, but I, I would certainly say I wouldn't worry too much about those bubbles being able to rehydrate and, and survive uh, desiccation. So um, that would be my first thought on that, just to, just to try to let that material dry out off-site um, or not near the water. Yeah. That Exactly. It, it desiccates quickly and so it can be, you know, of course following whatever regulations apply where you are, it can be landfilled or composted. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of how small is small, I would say it's really, it's very, it's labor intensive. Um, it could be, and therefore potentially expensive if you're having to hire somebody to do it or a lot of work if you're doing it or volunteers are doing it. So it's really, you know, um, how much can you bite off? And the cases, in addition to Grand Lake, I think Pleasant Lake is another one where a very small infestation was found, hand pulling was used effectively. So yeah, I think all the cases we know of are you know, su substantially less than an acre and you might have either you know, small discrete areas or kind of scattered stems. So just, just again, thinking about weeding your garden, it's you know, kind of, 
how much, you know, sort of how much can you take on? And of course, you know, complicated by the fact you're in water. Uh, let's see, uh, nice presentation, Wesley. Did any of your analysis evaluate effects of increasing the number of aldehyde applications per season on starry stonewort FOO or density? I don't know what FOO is. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably frequency of occurrence. Um, okay. And that is something that we, we have data on, so the number of treatments done in each year. I did not include that in the analyses that I've conducted so far, and I think that could be an interesting thing to look at. Um, the one issue, kind of a technical issue, a statistical issue, is that we have a lot of highly correlated variables. So typically the total amount that you're treating on a lake is going to be highly correlated to the number of times you treat. So we can really only include one or two of these variables in our models. Um, so that's, that's one issue with those kinds of data, but I do think that's an interesting thing to look at. And I think it's maybe better looked at with some of those case studies like Lake Cronus, where we can isolate each individual treatment and say, okay, did this initial treatment was that effective mid-season treatment, late season treatment. So those data might be better suited to that. And, you know, we kind of showed some, some information on that today. And um, as we move on and kind of for the, the final publication of this, we'll have a couple more examples that we can uh, maybe more accurately point to timing and repeat treatments. Yeah, and I think that underscores the need for more experimental work. You know, as Wes showed, there's a huge table of all these different treatments that have been done, uh, you know, different algicide, different algicide and herbicide combinations. And there's undoubtedly a lot of variation in there to be explored that is not something we can address in um, an analysis like this of these monitoring data, um, but are really important for um to be addressed through experimental work which i know is you know there are other labs other teams um, doing that type of work as well okay uh this is an interesting one any experiences with after hand pulling or other treatment of seeding with wild rice to the same environment uh for those areas which can handle wild rice yeah, I don't have any firsthand experience in that. And I, Dan, you might have a little bit, but I, I will just say that there's uh, not been a whole lot of work on kind of reseeding aquatic vegetation, but it's an area in our lab even of active research. Um, and, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll let Dan, Dan jump in on that if he has anything to add. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And interestingly, some of the Minnesota lakes that have had starry have also had um, have decent wild rice in some cases and so there may be some overlap in habitat suitability. Um, I think that question in general of how do we restore native diversity um, is a really key one that's yeah as Wes said just really underexplored in lake plant communities. Um, it's what we do in prairies, it's what we do in often in wetlands um, but with more aquatic systems when you have control of submersed species like starry stonewort, there's just very little known. So yeah, Mike Verhoeven, uh, one of my PhD students is looking at that, not in the case of starry stonewort and wild rice specifically, but um, in terms of um, trying to recover greater native plant diversity. So huge unknown where I think there could be a lot of work done to um, advance our ability to, you know, we have such a focus on treatment and control, um, but I think there's opportunities to provide more benefits by also focusing on how we recover native diversity. Uh, with a small infestation such as on Grand Lake, uh, why can't it be contained with a silt fencing so boaters don't go through the area? Uh, I realize this is maybe a DNR decision, but containment seems to be important to prevent the spread. Yeah, so, so I think one issue is that it is, it is literally at the public access where boaters come in and out. And so you can't um, put in some sort of fencing or barrier without functionally closing down that access. And that's going to be a a pretty widespread issue because of course, you know, humans are, are vectors for spread of invasive species and boat access is because of, you know, the turbulence of the crops, um, you know, they're disturbed areas that create a lot of opportunities for new species to become established. And so, um, you know, there's often an association between starry stonewort 
being nearby public accesses or in and around accesses. And so containment, it creates a challenge for containment. In the Grand Lake case, you know, because they are getting such good control with hand pulling, um, they're monitoring the lake um, each year and they're, they haven't found starry stonework popping up in other locations. So I think effectively they're getting good containment through that hand pulling. All right, um, most of the rest of these are thank yous. Um, uh, one person that talked about how big the area for hand pulling thanks you better understanding now what can be tried. Um, more thank you for good and thoughtful answers. Um, then a question to me, uh, this, this will be, uh, we're recording this now um, through Zoom and so far Zoom has always recorded things correctly. So uh, we will be posting this, this on uh, the Starry Store Collaborative YouTube site, uh, which is also maybe more easily accessed through the Starry Store Collaborative uh, website. Uh, starrystonework.org. There's a library there and videos, so it will be up there um, for everybody to see and review as needed. Um, another question came in. On Coronis, we have observed a decrease in CARA in the recent, in the reference areas as the starry density increases. So that may contribute to the loss of natives. Yeah, yeah, that gets to that issue that came up earlier in the questions of just the complexity of teasing apart the different ways that native species can be effective when you're be affected when you're thinking about treatment of an invasive species. Um, and this need to account for both the, the possibility of a, you know, direct effect of the invasive species on the natives, you know, they could be getting displaced. Um, there could be a benefit from treatment if you have, you know, the, the treatment reducing the abundance of the invasive and maybe that releases um, native species from being suppressed. But then we also, of course, always want to account for the possibility of unintended negative effects of the treatment. So those are, um, yeah, important possibilities to account for that can be um, just sort of tricky to tease apart and separate. And I'll just mention too, just to, to piggyback on that, that, you know, given, given what we found here and given folks, you know, personal experience on their lakes, you know, I think it's a really important question whether depending on the size of your infestation, you know, how much you want to treat, how big of an area you want to treat, knowing that there could be impacts on native species. So if you, you know, if your primary goal is for, you know, relievement near uh, boat access or where your docks are, even though you have stories somewhere in other areas of the lake, you know, maybe best just to treat in the area that's most important um, because, again, it, it may still be increasing in your lake and it may have these effects on a native species. So um, just important questions to think about, you know, when you have stories in your lake and when you're thinking about how to manage. And, and to, I, I, I just want to add a little bit more. Um, Wes mentioned, um, so there's a now Minnesota DNR um, AIS specialist, Carly Wagner, who um, did a master's with me on plant community impacts of starry stone work. Um, and to echo the point that was made in the chat, we saw year over year, we had um, permanent transects that were sampled using scuba diving. And we were able year over year and did that on another lake as well um, in Northern Minnesota and saw a very rapid um, expansion of starry stone work and concurrent decrease in um, native species. So we definitely know that is, is clearly happening. And so hopefully we'll have um, that resolved out within the next year or so published. And a comment came in that is in agreement, I think, to what you're saying. Abundant Kara is a great indicator of a lake's vulnerability to infestation by starry stonework. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, starry stonework, like Kara, is a, a Caracian algae, a Karaphyte. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, ecological conditions that they're going to share uh, an association with or kind of overlapping niches. And I also just, just add too that I think there's a, a big issue as most folks are probably familiar with, with kind of this cryptic invasion of starry stoneworts in, in these care beds. So we've been now doing work in Coronas where you have these starry and care that are intermingled, which I think is probably in many lakes, 
kind of hidden that sorry somewhere's there invading too. So that's just another aspect to be aware of as folks are monitoring or um, you know worried about sorry somewhere near lakes. You have big cara populations to make sure you're really careful about when you're examining those cara beds and in those rakes when you pull up the cara on them. Just to make everyone's work even that much more tougher as they they do their plant surveys. But yeah, thanks, Wes. That's great. <laughs> yeah, and I. And sorry, to, sorry to keep on adding on, but um, you know, Wes mentioned that uh, Surrey Stonewall was found on Cronus in 2015. At that point, it was over 200 acres. I think it's because of that very issue that before there was a lot of attention being paid to Surrey Stonewall in this region, you know, people weren't taking the time to differentiate the different carophyte species. And so, um, you know, I think there's, there were things that were likely missed by um, not paying sort of careful attention to what really is care and what isn't. All right. Well, I think the questions have petered out here. Um, this has covered a lot of ground here in just over an hour. Um, really, thank you to Wes and Dan. This is a, it's a really interesting presentation, a lot of great information, a lot of great questions to all of you. Um, so far, this is by far the most questions we've gotten at a, one of these. Um, so you, there's a lot of a lot of thinking and acting going on out there, and this covers, uh, you know, from you know we've had responses today from Canada to Minnesota, um, so you know we've got a lot of a lot of stuff coming in here. It's all it's all good thinking. So thank you to all. Um, more thanks coming into both of you. So <laughs> thanks yeah. guys for taking time. This is really great. We're looking forward to your publication of the final report whenever that might be, but I know it takes time. <laughs> yeah, thanks, David, for inviting us to present. It was a lot of fun, and thank you all for showing up and asking great questions. All right. Yeah, I'll echo Dan, thank you. Thank you to everyone who, who came and asked questions and, and came just to listen, and, and thanks again for hosting us, David. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you all. Have a good day. Bye.